Um, the aim of the talk today is to provide you with a clear connection between the theory that we've covered so far and the manufacture of novel steels. So, uh, to remind you, um, this is a, an important diagram where for a particular temperature T1, we are plotting the free energy of ferrite and the free energy of austenite using, uh, you know, software and data, as was explained by Bo Sunman uh, uh, on uh, Monday. So you can calculate these curves as a function of alloying elements, temperature, and pressure quite easily. And the way in which you then go on to calculate the phase diagram is that you find the mixture of austenite and of ferrite which minimizes the total free energy. And that's given by this common tangent here. So this gives the equilibrium composition of ferrite. And this gives the equilibrium composition of austenite. And when we plot the locus of these points on a phase diagram, which is temperature versus carbon, we get the equilibrium phase boundaries separating the alpha and gamma phase fields. But here we have another point where austenite and ferrite of the same chemical composition have also the same free energy. And what that means is that if the austenite is richer in carbon than this point, then it cannot transform without uh, partitioning of solute uh, because there would be an increase in free energy. But to the left of this point, you can actually get diffusion-less transformation uh, with a reduction in free energy. And the locus of these points on our phase diagram gives us the T0 boundary with diffusion-less transformation being impossible on the right of that curve and in principle possible to the left of that curve. Now, in the case of bainite, this is a really important uh, concept, the T0 curve, uh, because as I explained to you last time, um, we think of bainite as forming exactly like martensite without any change in composition, not even the carbon concentration. But it's forming at a relatively high temperature, so the carbon escapes from the plate of bainite shortly after it forms, and that a new plate forms, it partitions carbon, and so on, until the T0 limit is reached when the reaction must stop because this mechanism cannot operate if the carbon concentration exceeds the T0 curve. Now, that means that we can actually calculate the point where the reaction will stop and is, is far away from the equilibrium condition. You can calculate both the chemical composition of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops we can calculate the volume fraction of bainite that you can achieve for a given average carbon concentration. And, you know, very often we look at images like this where we have plates of bainite and retained austenite in between. And we can calculate, you know, the composition of this austenite from this T0 curve, uh, assuming that carbides have not precipitated. And therefore, we can calculate its stability and the Martin size start temperature and start to look at things like the trip effect and so on. So the T0 concept is extremely important. And I mentioned to you that uh, I received a paper just uh, a few days ago, which listed a lot of uh, experimental data for these steels, uh, looking at the Bainite transformation. Uh, and this was work done by KTH in Sweden. And uh, if I plot those points uh, along the T0 curve, you can see there's huge agreement with the T0 or T0 dash, which takes account of strain energy, and far, far away from the equilibrium condition. Now, you will recall that I also explained that the carbon is not homogeneously distributed in the austenite uh, if we have done a short time experiment, which means that there will be some scatter in the data. Um, so you can see some points over here, for example, and, and so on. So typically, the carbon concentration of the austenite should lie close to the T0 or T0 dashed curve, uh, given the absence of carbide precipitation. Because if carbides precipitate, they absorb the carbon that's in the austenite, and the transformation can progress further. 
Now, it's also important to note that if I reduce the transformation temperature from here to here, then I will be able to get more bainite. Okay? But at this point, I will get zero bainite, even though we may be at a temperature of something like 400 degrees centigrade. So the T0 condition is really important. OK, so what we want to do is allow the bainite to form, allow it to partition carbon, and even allow it to form precipitates inside the plates. These are extremely fine precipitates, rather like those we obtain by the tempering of martensite, because these really are tempering reactions happening shortly after the plate forms in timescales that we can't control. But this kind of precipitate, which forms from the carbon-enriched austenite, is brittle. It's cementite and it's an uncontrolled precipitation of cementite because we are not tempering for a certain time, etc. All this is happening as we hold at the isothermal transformation temperature. So these carbides can be brittle and therefore compromise the toughness of a strong steel. The strength comes from the fact that these plates are only about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. So what we want to do is we want to stop the reaction here, okay? And we know from uh, cast ions, uh, we've known for uh, a century at least, that if you have a high silicon cast iron, then that favors the formation of graphite rather than cementite, okay? That means that cementite does not like silicon in the system. And if you have sufficient silicon, then precipitation from austenite can be completely eliminated over the timescales of typical experiments and heat treatments. So to stop the reaction here, you can add silicon as an alloying element, you can add aluminum as an alloying ad element, and uh, chromium also works. Of course, uh, you have to think about what other properties will be affected by these additions. So the idea is that we do not like this uncontrolled precipitation of cementite during the bainite reaction. Uh, and therefore, we add alloying elements to stop the precipitation of this cementite. And you can see that by eliminating the carbides between the plates, we can get a dramatic improvement in the toughness of a bainitic steel. Now, of course, we need to calculate, you know, how much silicon should we add to prevent precipitation of cementite from austenite. And the problem is that the solubility of silicon in cementite is so small that there are no experimental data, uh, no thermodynamic data of the type that Bo Sunman was uh, describing to calculate how much silicon we need to prevent the precipitation of cementite from austenite. Now, when you do not have thermodynamic data and you are not even able in principle to do an experiment, then the best method is using first principles calculations where you just use electron theory and you'd look at the cementite crystal structure, remove an ion atom and substitute it with silicon and see what the change in energy is. So here, for example, are calculations of the type I've talked about. And um, this is the unit cell of cementite. Um, and what you do is you replace one of these ion atoms with silicon, and there are two different symmetries at which you can locate the silicon atom. So there are two calculations here, and you see the change in energy here. And you can see that just substitution of one ion atom in the cementite lattice causes a huge increase in the energy of, uh, in the stability of the cementite, okay? So we can take these numbers and actually introduce them into thermodynamic databases. Now, one of the really nice things if you suppress the formation of cementite is that, of course, this carbon-enriched austenite becomes stable even at room temperature because carbon is a very powerful element in stabilizing austenite relative to ferrite. So we end up with a really nice mixture of fine plates of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite, which has a high toughness uh, in its vicinity. So supposing that we design uh, such an alloy where we have 
stop the semen dicrystation. We expect really good mechanical properties because we've effectively got a composite of ferrite and austenite in our system. And we've obtained austenite by the cheapest possible alloying element, which is the carbon concentration. And that carbon concentration in the austenite is typically 1.2 weight percent, even when the average concentration of carbon is very, very small, like 0.05 weight percent, because of the partitioning from the bainite plates into the austenite. So to see whether this will lead to really good mechanical properties, here is an alloy, a very simple alloy that we made, uh, which has uh, you know, silicon to suppress cementite, and we need manganese so that other phases don't form at, uh, during cooling from high temperatures, and a medium carbon concentration. And of course, we obtain our nice composite material here, which is these incredibly fine platelets of uh, bainitic ferrite. And you remember, in a platelet, the mean free distance is just twice the thickness. So if the platelets are 0.2 of a micrometer in thickness, uh, the true thickness, then uh, the mean free slip distance, which goes into all the yield stress uh, equations, will only be twice 0.2, which is 0 0.4 micrometers, irrespective of the length of the plate. So basically, you've got a process here which by phase transformation alone can produce an incredibly fine grain structure. And remember that thermomechanical processing cannot produce a grain size of 0.4 micrometer for ferrite, for example. Okay? And the fact that you don't have to deform the material to produce this fine grain size means that you can make very large samples. You know, you're, you're not limited to, uh, say, rolling deformation or wire drawing, etc. This is a beautiful composite microstructure. The austenite does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature either. And uh, it may undergo transformation induced plasticity during deformation, and that would enhance the toughness as well. So we have a fine structure, both the austenite and the ferrite, and we may actually benefit from the trip effect, the transformation induced plasticity effect, and there is no ductile to brittle transition temperature in the austenite, and the diffusion of hydrogen in the austenite is incredibly slow, um, and that's why you know I suggested that in order to hold um, hydrogen at high pressure in a steel cylinder, you might put uh, a cladding of austenitic steel uh, on the inside so that the hydrogen is, uh, has great difficulty, atomic hydrogen has great difficulty in diffusing out. So the austenite forms a barrier to hydrogen uh, penetration into the steel or diffusion out of the steel. And uh, we don't have any of this coarse, uncontrolled cementite. And there is a small carbon concentration in the ferrite. Carbon embrittles ferrite in a big way. And that's why, you know, with martensite, we temper the material in order to uh, obtain the optimum properties. Okay, so we have this wonderful microstructure, which I've gone at some length to describe. And of course, it will be strong. Uh, when we did some experiments to measure the choppy toughness, uh, it was a disaster. You, know, you can see that these are very poor properties because the ductile brittle transition temperature is actually above room temperature. So something is very wrong in our understanding, as I have explained uh, so far. Something is going very wrong in this uh, analysis that we get a toughness uh, which is extremely poor at room temperature or, or at cryogenic temperatures with the ductile brittle transition temperature being around you know, 120 degrees centigrade. That is unacceptable for an engineering uh, alloy. So what is going wrong? Well, if we look at the microstructure using optical microscopy, then we discover this, okay? That the bainite reaction has stopped leaving large quantities of austenite untransformed. So you can see here a huge region of austenite. This is a scale of 50 micrometers. So we've got this beautiful fine structure inside the bainite, 
And then we have these large regions of unstable austenite, which easily transforms into untempered high carbon martensite. So it's like throwing a brick uh, of 50 micrometers in size inside our really beautiful plates of rainitic parite separated by films of austenite. And the reason why these large regions of austenite, which compromise our toughness, are present is because no matter how long I hold this material at the isothermal transformation temperature, it will not transform further because the average concentration has reached our T0 condition. Okay. Now, this is a thermodynamic limit. I explained to you very carefully in the last lecture that it's a thermodynamic limit. Uh, it's not like the WBS of Hillett and co-workers or like the negligible partitioning local equilibrium that Furuhara often uses. Uh, those are not thermodynamic limits. They are simply kinetic uh, effects. Uh, they don't stop the transformation from progressing. So it seems there is nothing we can do about this. OK, so let's have a careful look again at the T0 condition. So this is uh, the T0 curve here. And the volume fraction of uh, bainite that I can obtain, the maximum volume fraction of bainite that I can obtain, uh, would be given by the lever rule here. So this is the average carbon concentration. This distance here divided by this distance here gives me the maximum volume fraction of bainite that I can obtain. And I want to get more bainite so that the large regions of austenite are consumed. So if I express this lever rule uh, in terms of the T0 concentration, the average concentration of carbon, and the carbon concentration in ferrite, then that's basically this distance divided by this distance. So normally, uh, I would ask you to tell me, you know, what are the three ways in which I can increase the volume fraction of bainite, given that this is a thermodynamic limit? Well, uh, this is unfortunately not a live lecture, so I'm going to go through the three methods. What this suggests, first of all, is that if I go down in temperature so that XT0 increases, then I can increase the volume fraction of bainite. But of course, there is a limit to how low I can go uh, for two reasons. One is that you might hit the martensite start temperature. And the other is that reaction kinetics slow down quite dramatically if you go down much below 300 degrees centigrade. So um, we should go as low in transformation temperature as possible. Uh, we'll assume that this is zero, okay? the amount of carbon left in the bainitic ferrite. Now, I could decrease the average carbon concentration X bar. If I move this vertical line to here, then obviously my volume fraction of bainite would increase. Uh, and I would not compromise strength because the strength comes from the very fine bainitic ferrite plates separated by films of austenite. And we are actually generating more of that nice microstructure. Okay. So we could, one method would be to reduce X bar. And the other method is that this T0 curve depends also on the substitutional solutes. So I could do something to move the T0 curve to larger carbon concentrations. Okay. So without doing any experiments, we created two new alloys. This one is basically halving the carbon concentration. Okay. You don't compromise strength, but you get rid of the large regions of um, austenite. And here we have substituted manganese with nickel while maintaining a large carbon concentration because nickel shifts the T0 curve to larger concentrations compared with the corresponding manganese alloy. Okay, okay so let's see what happened. Well, First of all, if you look at the microstructures, we've lost all those large regions of austenite. We have this beautiful uh, films of austenite and uh, the plates of bainitic ferrite. And look what happens to the toughness. Okay, So this is the original alloy here. And we have shifted the transition temperature by 200 degrees centigrade to cryogenic temperatures. Okay, So now, now the impact properties of these two alloys 
are far, far better than the original concept, okay? So basically, we do not want large regions of Osterland. And once we proved and established this, this has been a common theme in a large number of publications where they focus on reducing the size of the austenite regions so that toughness is not compromised. And this even applies in uh, line pipe steels where you get the so-called martensite austenite constituent, which if it is coarse, it will cause scatter in toughness. Okay, so uh, I gave a talk on this at uh, the old British steel and they said, can we make a rail steel from this? Okay, and uh, these are samples of rail steels which are made without any carbide precipitates, okay? And only a mixture of bainitic pyrite and retained austenite and produced on uh, the normal production line with continuous cooling transformation. Okay? So you, you, you can't expect the industry to quickly replace the uh, technology that already exists with a huge investment. So you have to be able to produce your new microstructure on the same uh, facilities essentially and you know one of the problems with uh, rails uh, is you can see this in um, Dr. Juago you know Boris Pasternak's uh, Dr. Juago where the engineer Antip Antipo uh, has been pestering the repair shops about the quality of replacements for the tracks the steel was not sufficiently tensile the rails failed the test for strains and Antipo thought that they would crack in frosty weather Okay. So, uh, ordinary rails are not particularly tough and they are usually made or uh, the vast majority have a structure which is perlite, which looks, looks like this in two-dimensional sections. Uh, people describe perlite as alternating layers of cementite and ferrite, but that isn't actually true. You should think of a colony of perlite as being a bicrystal of cementite and ferrite. And this was first demonstrated by Hillert, who did uh, serial sectioning experiments many, many decades ago. Okay. That all the cementite inside a colony of perlite is connected and is a single crystal. And all the ferrite inside a colony of perlite is connected and is another single crystal. So there are two interpenetrating bicrystals. And the best way to imagine it is if you take a cabbage and a bucket of water. The cabbage represents uh, our semen tank and the water, the ferrite. You put the cabbage in the water, that's our colony of perlite. And when we take two dimensional sections, of course, we will see alternating layers, but that's misleading. Now, the reason why I'm uh, talking about this is we want to design rail steels using carbide free bainitic steels because if you have a colony, then a colony does not resist the propagation of a crack because the ferrite will all be in the same orientation and the cementite cracks easily. So if you like, the, the cleavage facet size in perlite is the colony size, it's not the interlamellar spacing. So to avoid this, we completely eliminate the carbide and instead use our carbide-free bainitic steel. But you have to understand what the requirements are for a rail steel. And the most important requirements are rolling contact fatigue and wear resistance, because you know a train has metal wheels which go over metal wheels. Rolling contact fatigue is a bit more difficult to explain. Uh, wear is very straightforward. But supposing you take a sphere and you put it onto a flat surface and then you apply a, a load from the top, then actually, if this is the location of the surface and we are going inwards, then you get a peak of shear stress under the surface, okay, uh, under the contact surface. And every time, you know, your wheel goes over the rail, it's inducing a pulse of shear stress which is maximum under the surface and fatigue damage develops. And eventually, you know, something can fall off and uh, cause, cause significant problems like derailment. Okay. You can think about rolling contact as a combination of compression 
and torsion at the same time, right? So if you put one hand, uh, uh, your folded hand on your other hand, and then you push and you twist, that's the kind of stress that you get under the surface. Okay, so how do we uh, how do we measure wear? Well, uh, you know, there, there are very, very well-established methods uh, in the laboratory for looking at rolling sliding wear. And of course, you can also examine the development of damage under the surface. So here we have um, our material in orange at the bottom, and this is a, a standard wheel material, and they are rotating, but at different speeds, right? So the two wheels are rubbing against each other due to the contact pressure, and they are rotating at different speeds, and therefore they will rub against each other, okay, and then cause wear. And this is the uh, what the actual specimen looks like. So that kind of a test is uh, really quite common in industry. And uh, when you do these tests uh, to measure both um, the fatigue process under the surface. If, uh, if you've lubricated the system and also the wear resistance, you see that the carbide free bainitic steel outperforms any of the other rail steels. Uh, these are full scale tests, actually, these are not laboratory tests. Uh, full scale testing done in Poland, where they had the facility, where you basically we had to stop the experiments on the carbide free bainite because uh, the tests are expensive. Uh, then, of course, you don't take your rail and you immediately put it into uh, operation because that would be unsafe. You've got to, uh, there are uh, test facilities in different parts of the world where there are heavy trains going around in circles, uh, large, large circles, to test the properties of rails. And this is uh, from my colleague Kevin Solly. On this side, you have the carbide free bainitic rail, and this is your normal politic rail. And the carbide free bainitic rail has a toughness of 50 megapascal root meters. And you can see that the, the sort of fatigue damage that you see here is basically absent, absent over here. And this particular test used uh, 90 million uh, gross tons of traffic on a curve. And the basic reason why it performs so well is that we don't have hard particles, just a mixture of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. And also, if you look at the uh, wear rate, the rolling contact wear rate, uh, then the carbide free bainite is the only material that reduces wear on both the wheel and the rail. You know, if you make these rails better, then the wheel suffers more. Okay. So this is now a, a commercial product, and uh, one of the most exciting um, applications is in this channel tunnel that normally you cannot see inside the channel tunnel, but this was taken uh, when the rails were installed. Uh, the carbide free bainitic rails were installed on a fairly straight section, okay? And in November 2019, I had a message from uh, our French colleagues explaining that uh, the rail has achieved 1 billion gross tons of traffic without, without uh, um, grinding. So the normal procedure with normal rails is that around you know 500 uh, million gross tons uh, inspection is done and the rail is ground to remove the fatigue damage. This has not had the grinding uh, after 1 billion gross tons of traffic in 2019. And of course, you know you really don't want to stop traffic in the channel tunnel. Uh, so this is a good good material to have. And uh, they also sent me these images. Uh, so this is the normal rail. You can see all this damage from fatigue, which would be ground away by a train, uh, a special train. And this is the surface of the carbide free bainitic steel. Now, the structure that I've described, carbide free bainite, is extremely versatile. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that you can actually control the length scales of the bainite plates and the films of austenite and the volume fractions and so on, by altering things like transformation, temperature, chemical composition, and so on. And uh, a lot of work has now been done all over the world using different varieties of carbide free bainitic steels. And I can plot, uh, plot the actual data here. 
And these are quenching tempered Martin Cetic steels. We are plotting ultimate tensile strength and fracture toughness. And some of the carbide free bayonetic steels even match the very expensive Maresian steels in, in, in these properties, which is uh, fracture toughness and ultimate tensile strength. The advantage of Maresian steels is that when you make your component, they can be quite soft. They don't contain, they are Martin Cetic, but they don't contain carbon, so they are soft. And then you give a heat treatment to cause uh, precipitation hardening with uh, intermetallic compounds, which gives you the strength in Maresian steels. Now, you can't do that with the carbide free bainite. Once you've generated the structure, uh, you are stuck with it. Uh, now, for many years, I worked uh, with, with this beautiful steel company. This is in uh, Switzerland. Uh, it's a Swiss steel. And uh, over many, a period of many years, we designed quite a few uh, bainitic steels, which are now in production in the sort of components that they measure. So this is a, a this is a group. Esco metal is a part of uh, what was originally Swiss steel, uh, and uh, this is a fuel injector made from carbide free bainite, uh, and uh, obviously it goes into diesel engines. Uh, it, there are fasteners that Swiss Steel specializes in, which go into airbags, into wheelchairs and tool holders. Um, cast irons should no longer be thought of as brittle. You know, uh, if instead of having a perlite or, uh, or some other microstructure, you have the carbide-free bainite, then you can actually get really quite impressive impact properties for quite high strengths. So this is a very large component made from the so-called Austempered ductile cast iron, uh, which has significant toughness, even though you, know, you have uh, these large graphite particles and even some residual martensite in the un untempered martensite in the structure. Now, I want to prove to you that the austenite is playing a significant role by transformation-induced plasticity. So, here is a really nice experiment where we do a simple tensile test on uh, a structure containing uh, the sort of retained austenite I've described. And we do one test at room temperature. Uh, let's say that's uh, you know, 25 degrees centigrade. And another test at 200 degrees centigrade. Now, why do we test at 200 degrees centigrade? Well, 200 degrees centigrade doesn't do anything to the microstructure because the structure is obtained by transformation at a higher temperature. Okay, uh, The bainitic parite and retained austenite structure is obtained by transformation at a higher temperature. But by testing at a slightly higher temperature, you're reducing, uh, you reducing the, um, sorry, you are increasing the stability of the austenite because austenite becomes more stable as you increase the temperature. So it will not trip during the course of transformation. And look what happens, okay? Uh, in the sample tested at room temperature, you get all this elongation, right? But testing at 200 and you don't even have work hardening, right? The austenite is simply not tripping. You can measure the, um, uh, austenite contents here and here, and you can demonstrate that here it has steadily tripped. Okay, so you're left with much less retained austenite after the test, whereas here it's essentially unchanged from the beginning. So the austenite is actually playing a critical role in controlling the properties of this structure. So I will stop there and uh, I'll be Happy to answer questions, but it is really interesting that we can use some very basic theory and some very simple calculations to optimize the amount of um, bainitic parite and therefore inversely the scale of the austenite left in the microstructure. And without doing any experiments, predict two alloys which actually perform very well. So thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you again, Harry, for your very 
excellent presentation and very good information that uh, you show uh, show with us. Um, do you have um, looking for a, a limit for uh, our steel design? Do you have uh, some idea or recommendation about the the maximum hydrogen content? Uh, for fully magnetic steel, for example, speaking uh, um, uh, um, uh, or low carbon magnetic steel and a high carbon magnetic steel, for example. Yeah, so the way uh, that hydrogen works in embrittling the steel is that it must be able to diffuse, okay? Because the concentrations are very small, you know, even one part per million average concentration can embrittle the steel, but there is no theory which can explain why embrittlement can happen with one part per million. So what, what has to happen is that when you have a stress concentration like the beginnings of a crack, that attracts the hydrogen and concentrates it, and then you get embrittlement. So it is only diffusible hydrogen that causes embrittlement. So if you have in your structure a lot of uh, retained austenite films, then that prevents the diffusion of hydrogen. But there is a second consideration. Uh, the hydrogen must be attracted to the crack tip, and the greater the stress, the more it will be attracted. So the hydrogen embrittlement problem is much more serious with strong steels than with weak steels. Uh, so when I say weak steels, I mean, you know, you don't always want strength in a line pipe. Yeah, you are limited to something of the order of 500 megapascals because all the other properties have to be. So those are much more tolerant to hydrogen than, for example, uh, the steel we might use in a landing gear mm -hmm. or, a, or a very strong steel. So it all depends on what uh, component you want to make uh, as to whether we need to worry about a particular concentration of hydrogen, how the hydrogen gets in, and how it's able to diffuse inside the material. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, um, I'm glad you asked this question because uh, it's not long ago that I wrote a, a, a big review on uh, preventing hydrogen embrittlement, which covers all this that I've explained. So what I'll do is I'll send you, send you the paper. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Now I think uh, if I am correct uh, in the name, Abdel Rahman Abdallah from Ed's Steel. Is it correct? I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Vadisha. Thank you for uh, your appreciated effort uh, for explaining this presentation. I just want to ask you a question about how I can differentiate between the Microstructure of bainite and martensite because I think it's like similar uh, for me. Please, yeah. Can you? Uh, so, um, if you look at the video of the third lecture, okay, uh, which is uh, which is online, then uh, I showed you the contrast that develops between bainite and untempered martensite. So, if you have a mixture of the two phases, then mm -hmm. even using optical microscopy, it's very easy to distinguish them because one will appear dark because there's a lot of structure inside the bayna, but not in tempered martensite. But this is a, a very common question, okay? How do we distinguish? Okay. And, uh, in, in this book, which you can download free of charge from my okay. website, yeah, there mm -hmm. is a, a, a section of a few pages which tells you how to distinguish between bainite and martensite using different techniques. I mean, okay. you don't you don't necessarily need transmission electron microscopy to do that. Uh, right. You can do that uh, using, you know, much more common techniques. So uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, book, but you can download it free. Yeah. Okay. okay? Thank and you. It has the information. Thank you, Mr. Bat. Okay. Thank you so much. Now it is the time of Octavio Rafael Carvajal, if I am correct, from Gerdau, uh, Mexico. Yes. Hope it is correct. Hello, hi, how are you? When you were working in this uh, 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 free carbide steel for rail, you need to design a new way of cooling during rolling, a control cooling for 
for make this transformation to happen in the, in the exact uh, temperature? Uh, no, uh, we were we were told that we should design the alloy for the facilities that already exist for politic rails because to make an investment is a is a big step, and uh, I think it was easy to do that because of the hardenability of the alloy. You don't want it uh, to have too many alloying elements because then it would take will be too slow to transform, and you don't want too little because then perlite or something else would form. So we have uh, on my website, uh, you can find methods of calculating time temperature transformation diagrams, which are based on physical principles, uh, which helped us to look at the cooling rates available and to design the alloy for that purpose. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, but basically, they, they, they didn't have any, any force cooling or, or water cooling in, in the rolling mill. No. And don't forget, these are these are large sections. I mean, I've got a section over here. Um, so, you know, you, you won't be able to get uniform structure if you use some kind of uh, forced system. OK, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you to all of you. Now, I guess that there is no one else making questions. Please, if you, if you, you have this great opportunity to talk with Professor Vadesha, I, I recommend that there, there is quite a lot of people from the industry so they can really ask you because this was very interesting because you put together uh, theory with application in, in such a nice way. So it's, uh, I think it is a very good opportunity to ask any question. You are so kind and open. So maybe uh, Octavio, you are done or you want to ask another question? Maybe. Be you want yes, to ask I another can. question, please. I, I, I have another question, but it's, it's uh, from the other lecture for the Martin City lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to know is just I want to know that when you uh, perform the transformation for uh, to, to have a Martin City uh, in your seal, you cool fast and it's a very low uh, temperature uh, transformation. What happens if you heat the steel that have already a uh, martensite on on the on the matrix? You lost this uh, transformation and you lost the properties of this steel. Uh, so so uh, just to get your question right, uh, so you transform to martensite and then you heat it up. Yeah, uh, but not not in the plant, in the at the final. Uh, uh, place where the steel is uh, installed, for example, a uh, fire in a... Oh, I see, I see. Yes, uh, so, um, so there is, a, in all the building codes, uh, there is a requirement that the steel must continue supporting the load for one hour during a fire. And, you know, if you think of the um, Twin Towers, where, you know, a burning... Uh, an aircraft hit in the middle and then it caused a fire. The top part was held in position for an hour before it collapsed and then led to the collapse of the entire structure. So unfortunately, steel, uh, steel can't continue to support even when it's covered with fire protection for more than an hour because it would be just too expensive to design the building, which would never collapse in a fire. But one hour is designed to allow people to escape, really. Well, thank you. Thank you for your sure. answer. Thank you for you, Harry, for answering all these questions, which is always difficult from a so a variable audience that we are. And uh, I think uh, if there is uh, any more questions or if there is not, I think uh, we should uh, find you on Monday and we will uh, we will uh, keep recording uh, your lectures in on your YouTube uh, your channel for anyone who has lost uh, our conversation and your lecture as well. So thank you again for all that.